Good morning, everybody. We want to invite you guys to stand up. Thanks, Melody. I love you. Thanks so much. Hey, I want to invite you guys to stand up. We get a cool opportunity together this morning to just recalibrate, reorient ourselves. We're going we're gonna to find where God is, what he's doing, and we need to line ourselves up with what's going on in his court, right? Not necessarily in mine. I'm going to be honest, though, man. It's exciting to see all the, all the young guys and ladies out here ready to go have some fun. So I'm a little jealous. I'm a little, yeah, y'all can say that's awesome and that's cool. I'm jealous. I wish we could join you, but I hope you'll have fun for us. So I need some help, though. This morning, literally at 4 a.m., our drummer messaged me and said, dude, I'm sick. I can't come today. So we don't got drums. I need you to help us pour favor, all right? We're going to sing a great song. Just need you to bring a little bit of the thump for us. You think you can handle that? Awesome. Let's sing. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, you won't hold on. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the dark. I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. If you will carry me safe to shore, oh, 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 safe to shore, oh, 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 safe to shore, oh, 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 safe to shore. In the tomorrow, bring with each morning our eyes and sing. My God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. safe to shore. Far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us. Through the storm, far before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. Safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. Safe to shore. Oh, 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 oh. Safe to shore. Woo! <laughs> definitely, definitely love to thank you guys for helping out.
Man, you guys just close your eyes for a second. Let's pray and and you tell God, thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the ability to see. God, we would be so lost in the dark. We would be so hopelessly, hopelessly wandering without you, without you in the in the story, without your presence to guide. Tell him thank you. Tell him, God, we worship you because we can count on you. We can we can come to you no matter what what is happening, how bad the storm is around us, even if it feels like the whole world is on fire. If it's going down, God, you are the source and we find life that we find hope. God, we worship you. We thank you. We love you. And we pray this. We sing this. We believe this in Jesus name and God's people said. 
Amen. Hey guys, it's good to see all of you here today. Uh, always want to remind you each week that offering is uh, an opportunity you can drop off at the front door. There are trays as you walk in. Uh, we have uh, online donations through our website. You can text to give if that's an easier way for you to do that. But during the season, we're just not going to pass trays uh, back and forth. But on the way out the door, if you need to give, leave a gift, that's where you can do that. Want to give you guys some announcements. Uh, number one, youth group is back in full swing on Wednesday nights. Uh, so we're excited about that. That's right. There it is. Um, Pastor Eric has more details. If you don't know where uh, the location is, we're meeting downtown Lake Wales using one of the, the care center facilities. Uh, so it's a great space for us to use during this season as we wait for the new building to be completed. But uh, teenagers, uh, that's a good time for you. Uh, later today, uh, as the kids are dismissed in just a moment, they're going to have some fun foam uh, party stuff going on. Yes, there's excitement there. Um, and so um, we're going to be watching as the adults uh, try and sneak out to bring you back in so you don't have a, that fun. Um, but there is a Kona Ice right after uh, service day. The Kona Ice truck uh, is going to be out there. If you guys want snow cones, ICs, uh, they are available across the way. Just look for the big bright colored truck out there. It's this Kona Ice. You won't be able to miss it. Uh, an opportunity for you guys enjoying that as well. So at this time, I believe it is time for all of our kids who are ready to go have some foam party fun to make your way out the back in a safe, orderly fashion. All right, so hey, um, getting into the message. I'm sure you guys know by now, life is full of questions that have to be answered. Now, some of those questions are easy. Some of them are a little bit more complicated. But on most typical days, uh, we, we get faced with hundreds of questions, choices, decisions that we need to make a call on. We need to make a decision. Now, like I said, some questions are not really that big of a deal. You know, paper or plastic, uh, regular or decaf? Do you want hot or mild? Do you want your burger uh, medium or well done? Do you like Pepsi or Coke? What's, what, what's your decision there? And, and, you know, those are pretty simple, pretty easy. You know your preference. And you can just kind of rattle it off. Others, other questions that we face, that they feel like they're a lot more intense. They're a lot more important to, to kind of figure out, like, like where are you going to go to college? Where are you going to, you know, what career are you going to pursue? Who are you going to marry? Are you going to have kids? How many kids? Are you going to own a house? Are you going to run a house? Where are you going to live? Are you going to buy everything with cash, pay everything with cash, or will, will credit be a part of your story? What do you do with problems? Are, are, are you going to... Are you going to fight for that relationship or are you just going to give up and walk away? You know, these questions carry a lot more weight to them as we process our lives, as we kind of live through them. They're all pretty important questions, but, but then there are some questions that, that, that kind of top even that. There are some questions that at the core of us, we all need to struggle with. We all need to wrestle with. We all need to, to, to kind of deal with. In fact, there's a question that was asked 2,000 years ago, and it's a question that still needs to be asked in our lives today that, that we all have to struggle with. And we find it in Luke chapter 9, in, in, in verse 18. It says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, Jesus said? What about you? Who do you say I am? And guys, how we answer that question, it determines what comes next. Like our response to Jesus is going to shape how we live, what we pursue, and ultimately who we become. And you see, if our response to Jesus in that moment is, yes, you're the Christ, you're, you're the son of the living God, well, well, and, and then we follow him, we spend our life following him, that's going to impact who we are. Our values and our priorities are going to shift because of that. What used to matter so much it is now called into question in light of what we believe about who Jesus is. In fact, the more we know, the more it has a, the more it wrecks what we knew. Like, like, the more we know about Jesus, the more we follow Jesus, the more we pursue him, the more it wrecks the image of what we thought life was all about. And guys, that's really what the Apostle Paul's getting at as he continues to, to, to write this letter to his friends in Philippi in the first century. If you have a Bible, we've been looking at the, the letter to the Philippians uh, the, this, this past month, month and a half. 
And as we turn to Philippians 3, Paul's going to kind of roll into these, these ideas with, with his friends. Philippians 3 verse 1, he says this. He says, further my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. And so watch out for those dogs, those, those evildoers, those, those mutilators of the flesh. For it's we who are the circumcision who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And so Paul, he's, he begins this section of the letter, he's like, he says, watch out. Be on your guard. Watch out for those dogs, those, those evildoers, those, those mutilators of the flesh. And that sounds intense. It sounds like, that, like, like, like it's a horror film that he's talking about, these mutilators of the flesh. Okay, some history here. Uh, what's happening right now, in this time, there's a sect uh, in the faith, in the Christian faith, called, uh, called the Judaizers. And these teachers, they would go to different areas, and they would go around, and they would basically teach the people that they had to, that faith alone in Jesus wasn't enough. It was Jesus plus something else. And basically what they were saying was, in order to become a Christian, you had to first obey the Mosaic law. You had to become Jewish, and then you were allowed to be baptized into your faith in Jesus. You had to become circumcised. Literally, they would say, man, you have to be circumcised. They had to mutilate the flesh so that you can then, therefore, be baptized and become a full-fledged Christian. It, it, the salvation for them was not found in Jesus, but rather Jesus plus something else. And Paul said, guys, no. No, be on your guard against such men. Don't be fooled by such false teaching. Watch out for these people that are going to try and infiltrate your mind and, and lead you in a new direction, in a different way than Christ. Be on your guard if somebody tells you anything different than what I shared, Paul says. Listen, for us, we need to know, listen, you cannot be saved by works. Paul would say this, in, you cannot be saved by works. And for some of us, we think that's, that's so hard to grab our minds around. We can't escape this idea that we have to follow rules and guidelines and, and somehow by doing these right things, we're going to be in right standing with God. We think we can work our way into it. And we get swept away by the notion that we need to work for our salvation rather than working in our salvation. And there's a big distinction there. If I'm working for my salvation, it's because I haven't yet attained it. But once I have been saved, I can work in it to continue doing what God's called me to do. I'm not working for, I'm working in. And we start building our case for our own righteousness as we do, and it really boils down to two philosophies. Many people work within these two guidelines. They say, well, either I work my life doing good things. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to really buckle down. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to read my Bible. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to give money to the church. And I'm going to serve in this ministry, that ministry. And somehow I'll be good enough. Or, or we go to the flip side and we say, we, we focus our energy on not doing all the bad things, right? If I just stop doing all the bad stuff, then I'll be good enough. If, at least I'm not as bad as he is. At least I don't do all the stuff she does. And we compare ourselves to others and we say, you know what? I'm better than they are. And what happens is based on what we do or don't do, we believe that God will then accept us. Listen, you cannot be saved by works. The works you do may be evidence of the change that's in your life, but it has nothing to do with your salvation. And so if somebody tries to grab your heart and say, you've got to do something to, to be right with God, watch out. The second thing we need to watch out for is that your value is not found in your performance. Who you are is not bound in what you do. And again, the problem is we believe that our worth is tied to what we do. If I do a good job, then I'm valuable. If I work hard to produce a product, well, well then I'm going to make the cut. If I don't, then I drop a few value points and I start slipping away. And guys, we learned this from a very, very young age. We see it with kids all the time. Mommy, watch me do this. Daddy, see how I can dribble the ball. Look at my report card. See how good I did. And they wait for us to affirm them as if their value, as if their worth depended on how we respond to them. And sadly, people do this with God. We approach our faith with God in this way. We live our lives with this notion that we're not good enough and we have to be better and we have to perform more for, for us to be able to come to God. Guys, your value 
It's not found in your performance. Your value is found in who you know. Your value is found in whose you are. Your value is found in Christ, in Christ alone. And listen, he died to save you long before you were even close to good enough. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, so Paul says, be on your guard against those men who would mutilate the flesh. There's a better way found in Christ alone. And Paul says, hey, there's no confidence anyway. There's no confidence in what we do. There's no confidence found in the flesh in, in the things that we can do our own. In case that wasn't clear, let me help you out. Paul goes on and says in, in verse 4, he says, if someone thinks they have reasons but confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. And so Paul said, when it comes to being righteous, self-righteous, I've got every reason to boast. My resume outshines all the rest. I am stellar when it comes to things to boast about. I mean, just look at my spiritual resume. Like, does anyone compare to this? Like, if anyone was good enough, it was Paul. If anyone was good enough by the standards of the world, it was Paul. Paul could easily make a case for, for, for salvation built on works if he wanted to, for performance and worth. Just look at my resume, he said. And what about us? What about you? What about me? Like this week and you know, different points, like I think about some of the things that, that make up who I am, some of my spiritual accomplishments, some of the things that, that help shape me and form me into the, the man that I am standing here today. Things that I value, things that I treasure, things that I worked really hard for to accomplish and achieve, and I got a plaque or a diploma or something to put on the wall. Things that, 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 that I treasure and I value that, that shape me. Like, like, like um, I'm an Eagle Scout. I worked my way all the way up from, from the time I was 12 to the time I was 18. From, the, from a scout, a tenderfoot, all the way up to eagle. And I've got a display case here that represents every merit badge, every, every position I held in Troop 734. Uh, I, that was much of my teenage years, becoming, uh, learning what it means to be a servant leader and camping and developing skills and traits and all the different things that go along with that. I'm an eagle scout. I've got, I've got my, um, my diploma, my degree from Warner Southern College, now Warner University. Yeah, yeah, there it is, Warner. Uh, not just a degree, I'm summa cum laude here. All right, top marks in the class. High grades, high grades, absolutely. Uh, I, had, I had the extra tassels on, on the graduation uh, uh, walk in, in that respect. I've got it written right there, summa cum laude, there it is bachelor's degree in church ministries. I've got my ordination certificate right here where men of faith that I loved and, and cared deeply about put their hands, laid their hands on me and said, Steve, we're sending you out to ministry. You're going to be a minister for the kingdom of God. You're going to do work in God's church. You're going you're to be a powerful force. I've got a picture here that represents the many, many summers that, that I have directed a program here at Lake Aurora, working and pouring into the lives of young people, men and women who, who are now growing up to be leaders in the faith and the church. The past, uh, since 2003, I've worked as a counselor, an assistant director, a program director. The past 12 years, I've been working uh, with the high school program here at camp, pouring countless hours and time into the lives of young people saying, you know what, this matters, and I'm going I'm to make sure they have a chance to, to hear the gospel in an exciting and powerful way. This paintbrush here, uh, more than anything right now, it represents the two weeks of my life painting in the new facility. <laughs> Not with this guy, because this is huge, this is crazy, you couldn't, you couldn't draw a line with that, but um, uh, 17 years in ministry. Uh, working in youth ministry and, and 11 years here at the church in Lake Wales, uh, just, just doing what God's called me to do, giving time, giving resources, giving blood, sweat, and tears to the ministry of the gospel. I've got a picture of my beautiful family here in front of me, reminding me of the blessings of God, the, 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 the family we've built, the household that we have, the, the, the health and vitality of, of all that, that, that we see. 
if I were making a list of who I am and what matters to me and, and some of the, the spiritual resume for why I'm uh, gifted to do something for the kingdom of God, I would start here. I would start with these things and I might add a lot more to that list. What about you? What would your list look like? What would you say you were proud of and your accomplishments that, that make you who you are? What would you say, man, this is, this is, this is what makes me valuable in life. This is what makes me worth something. What do you pride yourself on? Because Paul says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. And as you think about that list, as you think about the things that say, man, this is what, this is what I really put my value and my, my, my worth in. As you think about it when it comes to your relation with Christ, I want you to lean into what Paul writes in Ephesians. Remember these words when someone tries to take you differently, down a different path. He says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, even good works, even good things, so that no one can boast. And so Paul continues on after rattling off all these, all these reasons why he has confidence. And yet in verse 7 he says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And so Paul says, guys, listen, what I thought was good was, was one thing, but I found something better. I found, I, I used to live for all these things built on my works and my accomplishments, my abilities, but I found a better way. I found something more than what, what you might see. I found something more to live my life for. I found something greater to lean in than, 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 than just myself. I found something greater to lean on than my self-righteousness. I, I found something better. I was thinking about that, just kind of thinking about, you know, going from one perspective to another. And I think back, um, my wife Becky and I, we, we, we celebrated 11 years of marriage this past January. And, and, and it's, it's so exciting uh, uh, where, where God's led us as a family and the blessings that I've seen in my life. But, but if, I, if, I, if I try to peer back into my history, I, I, I can see a vague picture of what life was like B.B., before Becky, right? There, there, there's a time before Becky in my life, in my story, and, and um, you know, uh, I was a young adult. I was a bachelor living uh, in a house that I rented with my sister, and she did her thing. I did my thing, but most of the time, my thing was I go, went to work, and then I would go home. I'd, well, I'd go out to eat and eat whatever I wanted because I had plenty of money to, to feed myself, not a family, but myself, um, and then I would go home, and I, I'd play video games, whatever the latest video games were. I, I'd watch uh, movies on my TV late night till whenever I wanted to, and I'd go to bed at whatever odd hour I wanted to, and then wake up, roll out of bed just in time to get to work the next morning morning, that was life. But then Becky came along, and it got way better. Like, way better. Like, like Becky made things different. We went on dates. It was lots of fun. And, and, and then there was a point where, where um, it wasn't just one date a week. It was just about every night we hung out together. And that was way better. It wasn't just dating. Uh, you know, occasionally it was mini golf. It was dinners. It was playing cards at, at, in her living room while, the, while her girl slept. It was, it was all this time building our relationship stronger. I thought I knew something good, but everything just got better. And then we got married. And I found something better. Like way better, guys. Way, way better. Man, that's a lot more awkward than I thought it would be. Like, it, way better. Life before Becky was one thing, but it was way, way. And then 11 years go by, and the house that we have, the life that we have, the, 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 the girls, the, the, the two dogs, the, the cat, you know. <laughs> it's, it just keeps getting better. The more time with her, it just keeps getting better. I used to think video games are cool, but then Becky came along and it was much better. And Paul says, whatever I thought was good, 
guys, whatever I thought was good, Jesus is so much better. Whatever you gave your life to before, whatever you thought was so much value, when you put it next to Jesus, it doesn't compare. It doesn't. My accomplishments, my works, Paul says they are rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. And the word Paul uses here in the text, it's the word scubala. And we've looked at that word before. It literally means that which is thrown to the dogs. It means rubbish. It means garbage. It's excrement. Very literally dung. Street language, we're talking poop here, people. <laughs> this word would have been really intense to describe somebody's value, their worth, their works. And Paul says, my works, my righteousness, I consider them scubula. They are poop. I consider them dog doo-doo. It's what I stepped in mowing the grass last week. That's what these are compared to knowing Jesus. Like these are good, but compared to knowing Jesus, that might as well be in the trash heap. He is so much more. Paul said, my resume, it's nothing. It means nothing if I don't have Jesus. Like, do you get what he's saying? Like this stuff may be good. It may have value, but compared to Jesus, it doesn't compare. Like, do we have that perspective today? Is that, is that really what defines our life, that reality? Like, like can you stare at your degree, your, your doctorate, your master's, your academic achievements and career and say, this is good. Like, this is really good. I worked hard for this. But, you know, compared to Jesus, knowing Jesus... Like, that's more knowledge and wisdom than can fill any library in the world. There is just so much there, you will never know it all. That's way better. Like, can you look at your trophies, your awards, your achievements, and say, you know, I'm proud of this. I, I worked hard on this. But next to Jesus, like, they don't even tip the scale. He just kind of blows the entire thing out of the water. You know, I, I love my girls. I love my wife so very much. And they fill my life with joy. They fill me with life. And life is way better with them than I've ever known apart. But guys, no matter how much we love each other, they will never complete me and fill me the way Jesus can. Like they aren't able to redeem my life. They aren't able to forgive my sins completely. Like... I don't want to know life without them, but the difference is I can't live life without Him. I can't. There's no way. My works, my service, my ministry, all the things that I do with my hands, my resources, my achievements, they are not essential. But Jesus is. I need Him to live and to breathe and to move. In fact, Paul tells the Philippians, knowing Jesus, it matters more than anything. It is everything. But that's the tension, isn't it? Like here's where we find our life in practice at odds with what we say we believe. Because we read this powerful chapter in Philippians and we, we affirm this is true, this is right. I want to know Jesus. I want to be there. But when you look at our choices, when you look at our life, when you look at the things that we're actually doing day in and day out, for honest, we tell a different story. We're living out a different story than what Paul's describing here. If we're honest, many of us, we believe our careers are more important. If we're honest, we believe our hobbies and, and our vacations and our family time, well, that's where life is found. Like, if we're honest, we believe money will somehow buy us happiness. If we have more things, that's going to make everything right. We, we pursue prestige and we pursue awards and we pursue honor and, and we strive to be successful and admired. We do. We want to look right. We want to make sure people receive us well. We believe awards and trophies and accolades are somehow going to fill us up. We may believe one thing, but we say something different. There's a tension here that we have to wrestle with. Because if knowing Jesus is where it's at, if knowing Jesus is better by far than anything else in the world, why isn't that who we are 24-7? Like, like, why isn't that our mindset in every choice, in every decision that we make? Like, if knowing Jesus is best, why are we so consumed with the lesser things rather than Him? 
it begs the question, do we even know him? Like really know him? Do we know who he is and what he brings to the table? Because I think if, if Jesus were just standing here in all of his glory, all of his splendor, we would see. We would know without a doubt that he is so much better than anything we could put on a table here to show off. That he is so much more. That there's so much life in him. If we could just see for a moment, we get what Paul is saying here, that knowing Jesus... Man, I could lose everything and I'd still be okay. I'd still be all right. He says in, in verse 10, he says, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him fully. Guys, is that our desire today? Is that what we want, to really know Christ? Like not our cookie cutter in the box, Jesus, but, but do we want to know the real deal? Because if that's our desire, then get ready for your entire worldview to be challenged. Get ready for everything to shift because I'm telling you, Jesus, like the real Jesus, not, not, not the Sunday school version, but the real deal that takes a lifetime to study, and then you still won't even know everything about it. Like, he's unpredictable. He's wild. His teaching, it's unconventional. It will turn you inside out and upside down to the point that Leonard Sweet wrote a book called Jesus. He just drives me crazy. Jesus drives me crazy because Jesus taught the way up is down, the way in is out, the way first is last, the way of success, it's service, the way of strength, weakness, you want to get the most, and you need to go where the least are. You want to be free? Well, then you need to give your life completely to God. Give complete control to God. You want to become great? Become low. Become least. You want to find yourself? Then forget yourself. You want honor? Well, then you think of others before you think of yourself. You put yourself down and let them raise you up. You want to get even with your enemies? Let me give you an idea. You need to love them and pray for them and bless them. That'll teach them. I mean... Talk about unpredictable. Talk about crazy. I mean, what good shepherd would risk the life of 99 good sheep to go look for the one that wandered away? Well, what employer would pay last minute workers a full day's worth of pay along with everybody else? What good father would throw a huge party for a, uh, for a wayward son that comes home after blowing his entire inheritance? What father does that? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just a small sliver of how Jesus loved to take a situation and flip it upside down and, and rock the boat and say things unconventional to get you thinking about how the kingdom of God is completely different. And Walter Wink said, if Jesus had never lived, we would not have been able to invent him. He's too unpredictable. He's like nothing we've ever known or seen. And Paul said, I want to know Christ. I want to know the real deal. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know Jesus. And guys, if right now you want to echo that thought, if you want to be like Paul and say, yeah, that's what I want too. I want to know Christ. I want to know the real deal. If that's us, we need to, be realize, we need to realize that we need to leave the comfort of the Jesus we think we know. And we need to embrace who he truly is. Not who we want him to be, but who he is. So in Matthew 14, there's this moment. We read the story about the disciples. Um, they're having a tough time out on the water in the boat. And it says in verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? 
And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Because in that moment, they saw him for who he truly was, is, always will be. But you go to the middle of the story, why were the disciples terrified? Why did they scream out in terror? Why were they afraid as they saw this figure walking on the water toward them? Why did they stay in the boat huddled in fear, unsure of what was happening, unsure of what was going on? I mean, I think the answer is pretty obvious. Like the reason they were terrified, screaming, uncertain, is they didn't know who was walking on the water toward them. They didn't know the one who was walking on the water and who he really was. They didn't know the one who was walking through the middle of the storm they were facing in their lives the way they needed to. And yet Jesus, he calls to us. He says, don't worry. Take courage. It is I, I'm Jesus. You don't need to be afraid in this moment. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. That's what Peter said. Guys, I don't know where you are. But I know in my life I need to hear these words again. Like I need to hear them fresh. I need to hear them new. Because I don't want to stay in the boat. Like I know there's another way to live life and another way to be. And right now I feel like I'm kind of huddled in the boat. And the wind and the waves is rocking back and forth. And I, I, I see a glimpse of something more, but I, I, I'm, I'm petrified by what I see in life. I feel surrounded by the crashing waves and, and, and fear has a moment and doubt and worry and uncertainty continues to rock the boat. And it causes me to think about my own ability, my own worth, my own performance, my own value. It causes me to question some of these things in my life. Like, I don't know if you wrestle with that, but there are days, there are moments where I wrestle with that. And so maybe today we can really sense Peter's cry. Lord, I, I, Lord, I so want to get out of this boat right now. I so want to live a different way. I want to ignore the wind. I want to ignore the waves. I'm so tired of just hanging on to the sides of the boat, looking to the place I long to be, but not knowing if I'm able to actually get out there and be there with you. Like I'm so worried about all the circumstances that are happening and the what ifs of, of, of all the, 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 the turmoil that's in our culture right now. But I long to be with you, Jesus. I'm just, I'm in the boat right now and I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get there. And, and guys, if we would just listen close, if we would just lean in, we would hear Jesus say to us, come on. Come on. Like you can trust me. Come on. Church, what we need today more than anything are eyes that would see Jesus clearly for who he is. To know with, without a doubt that he is walking on the water toward us through whatever trials, whatever circumstances we find ourselves. We need to know him fully. We need to see him completely. Why? Because people who know who Jesus really is, they get out of the boat. And they walk on the water. And they have no fear, they have no worry, they have no doubt. And they live the life that they were created to live, pursuing the one who set them free. And they can look at this table and say, you know, this is so good. But I know Jesus. And he is so, so much better. And so today, may we echo the words of Paul and cry out from the depths of our soul, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ no matter what. Amen? Let's pray. And so God, as we come to you humbly in this moment, would you give us a fuller picture of who you are? Would you reveal yourself in such a way that it wrecks everything about how we thought life worked in light of who you truly are? 
in light of how you're calling us to be and how you're calling us to live. God, remind us in these moments that, that we cannot earn it, we cannot work harder to, to, to win your affection, that you love us before we even knew to love you back, that, that God, that you were there through our faults, through our hurts, through our longings. You sent your son for us. Help us to see that and just trust in you. And God, through the wind and the waves and the struggles that we find ourselves in now, God, may we see your glory revealed in, in, in our life here and now. Give us a clear picture of who you are. And give us the courage to trust and to follow. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we respond to God's word today, as, as we come to a time as a family where we take communion together, I just want to ask us, I want us to reflect just for a moment, like, like why are we still afraid sometimes? Like, why do we still worry about this problem or this issue? Why do we still have doubts about, about our worth, about our identity, about our value and our purpose? Like, why are we still going through some of the same struggles that we've had for years and years and years? Same issues that we keep coming circling right back to. Like, why hasn't Jesus impacted the way we think and talk and live in a greater way? And why do we choose to stay in the boat when we really know deep down we want to be on the water with Jesus? Like maybe the simple answer is we don't fully know the guy walking on the waves of the storms of our life the way we should, the way we want to. And perhaps in this moment what we need to do is ask God to give us, give us a fuller perspective. Give us a fuller picture of who you are Blow our minds, open the eyes of our hearts and give us a glimpse of your glory and, and renew my desire, renew our desire to seek you, God. Like maybe in this moment as we reflect and we think, we need to let go of the self, uh, of the safe image of Jesus that we've created in our mind. And we need to confess that we've tried to, to fit Jesus to our desires rather than allowing our lives to conform to his. And what if in this moment we simply invite Jesus to overwhelm us with that picture of who he is? Full of wonder, full of majesty, full of goodness and love and grace. So powerful that we simply can't capture it all in. We simply can't explain it or describe it, but we know it's real. So today as we take the bread, remember this is Christ's body given for you. And so take and eat and embrace the fullness of life that is found in him. And as we take the cup, remember this is Christ's blood shed for you. Remember that he is washing you, cleansing you of all unrighteousness. You've been bought by the blood. You belong to him for those with faith in Christ Jesus. May we drink in remembrance of him. As Jesus stood accused before Pilate, Pilate turned to the crowd and asked the question, what shall I do with Jesus, who, am called, who is called the Christ? That same question echoes in our hearts today. What will we do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Who do you say he is? Because guys, that's a question we all have to wrestle with. 
It has implications in our answer that, that dictate how we should live the rest of our lives. It changes who we are to say we follow Jesus. It changes what we pursue when we follow Jesus. Who do you say that he is? And what will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? Today, as we sing a song of response, if you need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, come to the front and let's talk. Or maybe as we sing this song, you need to recommit your faith to ask God more fully for that vision of who he is. He is the Lord, our God. Let's stand. Let's worship. Keeper, you finish what you begin, and our provision through the desert, you see it through to the end, you see it through to the end.
You're the Lord, our God. Forever we will say, You're the Lord, our God. So as we go from this place, may we go out in the power of God, recognizing that He is greater and more than we could ever ask for or imagine. May we see a full picture of who He is this week, this day. May we cling to the cross, cling to the life that we have in Him, and let that be our guide. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys have a good week. Thank you.